Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes. This is your 133rd video cast, 123rd podcast for the week ending April 30th, excuse me, May 5th, 2022. A happy Cinco de Mayo. Thought we'd start on a happy note since it's been such a uh, chaotic uh, 48 hours and we'll get into that. Uh, had the pleasure to take both of my daughters to the, for the first time to the Princess Ball. Mimi had gone a couple of years back and this was a, a picture of us out in the courtyard with uh, little Lucky in the picture, our dog, and uh, that's uh, Annabelle, our youngest, and Mimi, our oldest. So that was just a tremendous time and uh, that's what it's all about anyway. But moving right along, I uh, want to uh, go through a couple quick media things. want to thank Devik Jane for including me in his article on Reuters. Uh, everyone knows the rate hike is coming. What people are a little unsettled about is what the guidance is going to look like from Powell. Is the next meeting going to be 50 basis points again, or is it going to be up to 75 basis points? Uh, and we found out the answer to that. It's capped at 50, uh, which is good. The market is trying to digest that. Also want to thank... Uh, Maynaz Yasmin for including me in her article on Reuters. She was asking about why CDS on banks was going up. And, um, you know, general loan quality has actually improved. Any CDS short-term spikes is related to, um, likely related to fears over a Russian default. Um, and then she pointed to the correlation coefficient between Russia's five-year CDS on sovereign debt and the bank CDS uh, it suggested strong positive correlation. So uh, that that proved out. Uh, we're going to actually talk a little bit about Russia today because, um, you know, it's not at the forefront anymore. I, I did say that this would become like an Afghanistan where it would be in the background, but it's having an impact on commodity prices and inflation. So I want to deal with it directly. Uh, and maybe, maybe we'll be coming to a uh, positive resolution soon. Also want to thank Ellie Terrett, over at Fox Business for including me in her article on crypto. She's become quite a crypto expert. She took a uh, certification at Oxford University, and she always puts out good stuff on that. For those of you who are interested in crypto, check out Eleanor Terrett on Fox Business. She has quite a few articles. Um, and um, my quote was just that uh, momentum was gathering in the crypto space as we're seeing more and more companies begin to accept crypto as a payment option. Companies like AT&T, Shopify, Overstock, Expedia, they're all putting it out there. Uh, wh whether it will be utilized or not remains to be seen because it would be like, say, you know, it would be like uh, the country club saying, uh, we'll let you pay for your dues with shares of Alibaba, um, you know, or, or rather, let, let's do a better one. We'll let you pay for your dues with shares of Cigna. Well, on the one hand, I'd say, well, that sounds really interesting. The problem is, is once I... Uh, exchange the Cigna shares for the crypto, I take a capital gain. So it costs me, you know, uh, 20 some odd percent, then you add state, uh, it costs me a lot more money to pay with the shares of Cigna than it does um, with uh, uh, just cash. And I think for people with crypto, uh, that's also an issue. However, uh, if, crypto, if crypto continues to weaken, Maybe many people will want to buy stuff with crypto and lock in the tax loss that they can use in forward years against any gains that they have in real businesses. So, um, but anyway, everyone's uh, making it available. That's momentum for them. Uh, you know, here's our uh, hit of the week to kind of uh, uh, embody what we're what we're experiencing here in the stock market. This was quite a hit, I got to say. I was a defenseman, and we used to do open ice checks all the time. He laid him out on that. I mean, sorry to see that was a Bruin, by the way, but uh, look at this. Unbelievable. Boom. That was such a great hit. Anyway, all right, let's move on to this stuff. Uh, let's let's take a general market barometer. So everyone was saying we have to have capitulation before we find a bottom. We need a 10 to 1 uh, down to up day. Well, you got it today. So, um, but, no, you know, nothing really changes. These indicators have been um, overdone for a while. So um, let's see here. I want to do a quick thing, just make sure all these are updated to the best of the ability. Um, okay, so here's your 10-day put call ratio. This is an extreme. I think I think the bottom is in. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to call it per se, but um, 
you know, and, and by the way, it's not dissimilar. We just basically retested from a from a couple of months ago and from a couple of weeks ago. So we're, we're likely there. But this put call just shows that everyone's buying insurance. When everyone's buying an insurance, uh, the fire has already happened and they never pay out. The policies never pay out. And the writers of the policies make bank and they just love selling the policies all day long because they make a fortune on the high implied volatility and they never have to pay out claims. And I think that's exactly what's happening right now. You look at these indicators, NDX, 1% EMA, this is bottoming like it wasn't worse than the pandemic and starting to come back. Um, basically, all the ones that were close last week are now at buy signals. I mean, here's NASDAQ up down on ball, balance volume. Um, here is, uh, let's just go to the next. Uh, healthcare stocks, they bottomed out. Now they're starting to rise again. Uh, here's S&P mid cap, uh, intermediate term volume momentum oscillator that bottomed every time it's gotten down here, it bounce, bounce, bounce with the exception of the pandemic. But uh, that's once in 100 years. NASDAQ intermediate term volume momentum, same thing, bottom range, you get bounces from that level. Uh, National Association of Active Investment Managers, they got down to 45%. They ticked up to 55%. They're still way underweight. Any strength in the coming weeks. And I actually uh, was uh, chatting back and forth with my friend um, today. And I said, I love this move because what happened yesterday is there was a lot of bearishness and a lot of weakness going into the Fed meeting. Expectations were really low. Everyone was short. They got their faces ripped off. They had to cover margin calls yesterday after the Fed meeting. That was a monster short covering rally of a thousand points up. And then um, so they all had to to buy. Then everyone chased long and boom, the bottom fell out today. Uh, margin calls, a lot of fund blow ups, probably risk parity because both bonds and stocks fell. So the risk parity funds, uh, you know, you can Google it. There are a few big firms that do it. They lever five to one and basically put you in a fancy, you know, fancy 60, 40 portfolio thinking that it's hedged when it's not. And, uh, and I'm sure there were just a ton of margin calls on that today. So, um, basically <clears throat> what you're seeing here. Is there still underweight and that strength now that you had all the margin calls, you had the flush out, you had the 10 to 1 volume. Uh, I think we're going to just see all these people have to chase the hell out of this. Even the ones, the you know, it's funny. I got a, a text from a friend yesterday asking me if they should uh, double down on a position. It was a blue chip com <coughs> vanilla company. And um, I said, you know, generally my answer is yes, but I never buy on up days and I never buy on up days that are up 950% because he called after the uh, after the move. Um, and whether he did or he didn't, uh, it'll work out fine because it's a great company and et cetera, et cetera. But I, I just never buy on green days. I just don't do it uh, unless the stock that I'm interested in is totally out of favor and is red on that day, then I'll buy. But I just don't buy things up. I buy when they're weak and I sell when they're strong. I sell on up days. Um, so that's that. PMO buy all, perfect point here at zero. Uh, every time you're at zero is closer to a bottom than a top. PMO Dow, Dow wasn't down. Remember Dow was at like 40. Dow finally hit a bottom yesterday and now it's ready to bounce. PMO uh, S&P wasn't down. It was still up here, even though the NASDAQ was down last week. It wasn't all the way down where you need to get a bounce. Now it is. It's turning around. Um, even the bottom pring bottom fissure indicator uh, is is down here. So everything is now overdone, and it's not even like you know it's it's a it's a difference between having to figure out the bottom with the scalpel and and with the crayon. And we're at crayon thing. Everything is screaming here that things are a bit overdone. Uh, doesn't guarantee anything. Everything we do is probabilistic. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a friend today and I said, look, our whole business is probabilities. You know, at the end of the day, you can lose with pocket aces in Texas Hold'em, but you've got to place the bet if you know anything about the game. And that's, that's exactly what we have set up here is we've been dealt pocket aces. If we're not taking advantage of this weakness, then we're in the wrong business. Uh, so that's, that's the name of the game. NYAD advanced decline. Uh, again, this, these are levels where you buy, not sell. Um, and I think a lot of the selling today was forced. Um, McClellan summation again, 
you know, bears would say this is a downtrend. I say you want to buy at these levels. Uh, this advanced decline, NYSE, negative 5,000. I mean, it, it, <laughs> these are times to buy, okay? These times don't even happen that often. Something like broke, and, um, and, uh, and I think you're going to see some of that money stabilize and, and start to rip in. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, I think that's all the general indicators that I want to look at now. Sectors stayed relatively the same. Um, where the opportunities are on, uh, yeah, again, tech, this is where you want to be a buyer. This is NASDAQ composite bullish percent. Uh, discretionary is not totally oversold yet, so I'd, I'd probably wait on that. Energy, not, not only halfway, I'd, I'd wait on that. Uh, financials does look a little bit oversold here. Uh, there's a ask me anything question we'll cover at the end uh, about Citibank. So uh, maybe an interesting question. Uh, healthcare sectors getting close here. So some of these could be ready for a nice bounce. Uh, Dow, eh, I wouldn't be aggressively buying Dow. There are some things that look like it's time to aggressively buy like tech, uh, info tech, et cetera, value tech, not, not no uh, earnings tech, but uh, stuff that's generating cash. Uh, NASDAQ, same thing. That's where you want to be a buyer. NYSE bullish percent down to 35. It's generally paid to be a buyer there. That could go a little lower. Uh, S&P 100, that's a buy level. Uh, real estate is getting close again. I was looking at Vernado the other day, which is commercial office space. Uh, people are going back to the office. Uh, didn't do anything yet. Uh, telecom oversold. Uh, and I think that's all utilities are overbought. So those are probably shorts. Um, okay. Now I want to do commodities. We haven't done them in a while. Everyone's worried about the dollar, uh, which we're going to cover in the article of the week, green line commercials. They tend to be right ahead of time. So let's take a look at time. Every time commercials have been this short, the U S dollar, what happens next? Boom. Dollar rolls over. They get short. Boom, dollar rolls over. They get short. Boom, dollar rolls over. They get short. Boom, dollar stops going up. Okay, here they were buyers. You got a huge rally. Then they're selling short. And boom, it stops going up. I think this is a critical example right here. This 2015 to 2016 to 2017 in the tightening period. It didn't roll over per se but it stopped going up. It had been on this parabolic move up just like we're, we've been on since 20, early 2021. And with this level of selling, commercials were selling, commercials are selling, it stopped going up and it just leveled off. And I think that's what we need here. Yeah, you got a little weakening. Uh, I think that's that's the kind of thing we could start to see here. Maybe you get a little more upside and then you know, you're gonna see a leveling off based on commercials. Look, nine out of 10 times, it's look, you can, you can take the pocket aces and fold them and never bet. But over time, there's no way you're ever going to win if you're not betting pocket aces. And that's what we're trying to do here is just bet the pocket aces when the odds are well in our favor. Doesn't mean it's guaranteed we're going to win the pot with pocket aces, but it does mean that uh, you got to take that bet over time. And over time, you're going to be a big winner. That's the name of the game. The Euro. Uh, commercials have been buying this into weakness. Buying into weakness. Got a rally buying okay it, it based for a while then you got a rally buying you got a rally buying you got a rally buying you got a rally so look you could say the commercials are wrong this time even though they've been right eight out of the eight last times over the last 20 years and that the that the euro is going to keep going lower forever i'd be a net buyer of the euro here i'd be a net seller of the dollar and would i be short the dollar no but i wouldn't be betting on monster upside you know, the blow offs at the top and the bottom are the are the most serious. So, you know, I'll say this and then two weeks from now, the dollar will be higher and first name Ben will say, what do you think about the dollar? But I will say this, that this is where the odds are in your favor. So, um, all right, Australian dollar, the commercials have been buying, you usually get a rally. It, it's the same exact thing. The dollar is probably uh, near a point where it stops going up, whether it consolidates sideways for a couple of years or it goes back down. Don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that the upside is limited here. You can pick up a few quarters in front of the steamroller, be my guest, but um, I wouldn't be betting on this. And, and this is the same here. They're starting to buy the pound. 
uh, into weakness, that just as they did here, you got a rally here, here, and this has been in a downtrend and still the signals work. Been in a downtrend since 2007 and still the buy signals work. So, um, all right, Canadian dollar, no one really cares. Next, uh, Japanese yen. Uh, and and not all the, these signals work great. Here they were major buyers and you got one of the rallies of a lifetime from 2007 to 2011. Uh, this is monster buying here. So I wouldn't be surprised if this weakness stops. Uh, it can persist for a while, 2013 to 15, but um, you know, I wouldn't be buying the yen, but I, I wouldn't be shorting it at these levels, that's for sure. So, um, all right, next. Uh, New Zealand dollar, no one really cares. All right. No offense, by the way, if you're from Canada or New Zealand, it's just, it's not really a big thing for the general markets. Um, you matter personally, it's just your currency doesn't. All right, moving on right along. Uh, crude oil. This signal is interesting because the lead time seems to be much bigger. So you see here from 11 to 15, commercials were kind of selling, 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 and then finally it collapsed and roll over. Uh, same thing here from 16 to 18, they were selling, 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 and finally it collapsed. And then here, they're selling, selling, and by the way, note here that it didn't collapse until they started buying again. So they sold huge, and then they started buying, and that's when you got the collapse. So they've sold huge here and they've started to buy. We haven't gotten a collapse. There may be a catalyst coming for that. So let's let's see. Um, very hard to make that case right now. Everyone's convinced that uh, oil is going to go up forever because the war is going to go on forever and yada, yada, yada. But uh, I can assure you the, the the stuff is in the ground and it's coming out, number one. Number two, uh, number two there might be some short-term catalysts. Um, I'll give you a hint. You got to have faith, quote unquote, and we'll talk about that. Uh, natural gas, uh, they've been buyers, not a great signal, but yeah, I mean, I, I could see, I could cert I could see a situation where natural gas retains its strength while, while, uh, uh, crude and Brent start to roll over and that's abnormal, but, but highly possible in this environment based on supply demand, um, issues. All right, ethanol swaps, we don't care about that. 30-year uh, bond. Now, 30-year bond, this has been interesting because if you look here, and this signal is not fantastic, okay? But if you look at this period from 07 to 7 to 10, commercials were big buyers, big buyers, big buyers, and nothing really happened. It was just kind of grinding sideways and then Boom, a multi-year, four-year rally. Same thing happened here from 2016 to 2018 during this tightening cycle. They were buyers, 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 buyers. And you didn't get the rally until they started selling off. You got a big rally. And they've been big, big buyers into this weakness. And now they've been selling off and we still haven't gotten the rally. I, I, again, with bonds, I think we're at an inflection. These, these things, um, and by the way, to put it in perspective, uh, we peaked in October of 2018 at 325 on the 10 year and in January of 2014 at 303 on the 10 year. I think we closed at 301 on the 10 year today. So just to put it in perspective, uh, you know, we, we could certainly be a lot closer. This is the ultra bond, long bond commercials have been hugely long this. Again, not a perfect signal, but um here we go. The 10 year note. This is a better signal. So, um, they were buyers here. They only got a short term re relief rally, just like we got with this one. But then they got buying aggressively in 18 and 19, and you got this monster rip your face off rally from 19 to 20. Th this is aggressive buying into this weakness on the 10 year. Um, could you have aggressive buying and not get a rip your face off rally? It just, it just hasn't happened. Uh, here was aggressive buying. You got a multi-year rally. So, 
um, anything's possible and you have pocket aces, you got to play the hand and you got to play it, you know, in decent size because uh, the odds are in your favor. So uh, let's see here. Where are the where are the grains? Let's talk about inflation. Where are the grains? The grains? The grains? Let's see. Um, well, while we're ah, here we are. Corn. Okay. <laughs> this is this is the most beautiful chart of all time in my view. So look, commercials. Here they were buyers, you got the rally. Here they were aggressive sellers as, as it was going parabolic and boom, collapsed right back to the base. Okay, here they were buyers, you got this monster rally, it's now going parabolic. They're selling the hell out of it like never in history. This looks so similar to this 2011 and 2013 move. You get the first parabolic move, a fake out, the second parabolic, higher highs. Everyone says, oh, this is a breakout, buy the breakout, and boom, your face gets ripped off right back to new lows. Well, guess that's exactly what they're saying right now. Ooh, this is breakout, this is a breakout, food shortage, blah, 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 IMF, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there, look, the commercials are selling the hell out of this thing like never in history. Last time they sold this much, you had a, looks like a 70% collapse in about a year. Um, and uh, this may be one of the best asymmetric trades uh, we see in a while. Could it go to 900 first? Damn well it could, but if you had to bet two years out, where is corn going to be? I'd say odds are much higher that it's at 400 than it's at 1100. That's for damn sure. So this is a really beautiful setup. Now, why is that important to a stock market podcast video cast? Because inflation has got everyone scared in case you weren't listening to the Fed meeting yesterday. And we think inflation has peaked. Look at this. Uh, same thing with soybeans. Okay. Same type of 2011 to 13 scenario, and I made a ton of money on this in 2012 with Cornwall uh, from this trade. And this is the exact same thing. The first high, commercials were selling into it. It peaked out at the parabolic, and boom, it just collapsed. And uh, all the way back to the beginning, you know, down from 1700 back down to 800. I think we're going to see the exact same situation in coming years and inflation is going to roll the hell over um soybean meal same story okay so you know the, the, what can give you an edge in these things soybean meal same exact story first a fake high then a rollover um this is so critical inflation is the key to this market and uh you want to take maybe short term you take the over weeks but uh remember the base effects the base effects is year on year inflation went parabolic last april and may so the next cpi print hopefully we'll see in in the next uh uh next week uh will be the first one that misses big because inflation was so high not that prices are going to collapse just that year on year because it moved up so fast last year i think it's going to be a lot less than than estimates and that's going to shock the market in a good way and, um, you know, uh, whoever got liquidated out of their stocks today is going to regret it. Uh, they probably had no choice, but uh, that's that's unfortunate because I think uh, I think a big move is coming. All right. Moving right along. Hard wheat. Same exact story. Big selling roll over. Commercials know what's what. Um, Spring wheat. Okay, same story. I think we've gotten through most of the commodities we need to cover. Oats. No one eats oats anyway. I don't think this indicator is any good. Uh, all right. Rough rice. I don't know. I don't, rough rice is a very thinly traded commodity. Canola, they've been shorting into. Uh, we don't have enough back data, but that's probably a good short if you can get any liquidity. Now, while they've been selling commodities, what have been com commercials been doing? They've been buying the S&P 500 here into the weakness. And they usually are early. The NASDAQ, same thing. They've been net buyers into the weakness. Dow, they've been buyers into the weakness. Russell 2000, big buyers into the weakness. All 
All right. Some of these, the signals aren't very helpful. Live cattle, they've been net sellers. I, I, I'm kind of agnostic on live cattle here because there's always the lead with the gestation period and all that stuff. I remember studying that stuff backward and forward in 2012. Um, marginal buyers of feeder cattle. All right, so maybe meat, but if grains go down, that'll help them, but it's always on a lag basis. Hogs, they've been net sellers into this strength. Um, maybe you get one final blow off top, but, um, you know, gun to my head, I'd be short hogs um, or just, you know, getting out of longs. Um, milk, this is an illiquid thing, but that they've been selling that. Non-fat dry milk, no one cares. Um, butter, no one cares. Cheese, Jesus, I didn't even know they traded cheese. All right, gold. Commercials have been aggressive sellers. Sometimes it takes a while, and then in 13, it just rolled back over. Everyone in their mother is saying, this is a cup and handle formation, and it's just made the handle, so we're going to go to 4,000. Could very well happen, but, you know, history suggests I mean, the signal's not actually great on this one, so I, I'm going to stay agnostic, even though, as a purist, commercials have been selling. I don't want to bet against them, but um, I wouldn't be certain that it's going to the moon because of inflation, as most people are, but I, I also wouldn't short it. Uh, silver is just a, a messy signal. Uh, High-grade copper. They were selling aggressively. Uh, you haven't had the collapse yet. And then you got some buying in here. My inclination with copper, I'm agnostic here. I wouldn't be going long copper here despite the quote-unquote breakout. Um, with this much selling ahead of time, I, I, I would think that you're going to see weakness to 12 to 18 months out in copper. And with all the China shutdowns, that should make sense from an industrial standpoint despite all this uh, stimulus. But we are going to talk about the cases rolling over in China, which could actually uh, bring bring some big demand back to copper quickly. Um, I'm more interested in the Chinese consumer than in how many empty buildings they decide to build in the next six months to hold things together before the election, quote unquote. Um, all right, what's this? Cotton. They've been big sellers. I mean, cotton, cotton's probably a short. Maybe it goes to 180 first, but two, three years out is probably back to 80. None of these are perfect, but they're barometers. And, 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 it, and, you know, and if you're concerned about inflation, this is the best place to get information, not a bunch of people's opinions on TV, but actually what are people with real money doing about it and how do they see things happen with all the data on the ground? Coffee, same thing. This thing, these things look like uh, commercials are selling the shit out of these, excuse me, <laughs> you know what out of these things. And, uh, uh, yeah. And everyone else is saying they're going to go up forever. I mean, this this to me is very, very comforting from an inflation standpoint, what I'm seeing here. So um, orange juice, and that's sellers. Maybe it goes a little higher. Usually that peaks in the winter. So yeah, maybe short that into summer. I'm sure the forward curve already reflects some of the weakness in summer, but all right, so that's the commodities. Hope that was helpful for everyone worried about inflation. This is from a guy over at Sentiment Trader. He says that I'm going to refresh your page right when you don't want me to. Um, okay, Jay is a senior market analyst at Sentiment Trader. Here we go. Dumb money confidence indicator is showing rampant bearishness among the traders who are typically wrong at the extremes. The market typically performs well over the next several months. They're as bearish as they've ever been. All these red dots were buy signals. That's when they were this bearish. So that's sentiment trader. Uh, Kalanovic was out. Sentiment is extreme, reaching extreme weakness in combination with light investor positioning and better than feared Q1 earnings should allow the market to rebound. So that's Kalanovic's latest note. Kind of a broken record, but he'll be right. Uh, Goldman's sentiment indicator is from Zero Hedge. Current reading is negative 2.2 out of 687 weekly ratings. First recording in 2009, there have only been 14 instances in which the sentiment indicator was more negative, i.e. it's time to buy. 
And then Ryan Dietrich put out the cover indicator. This time three years ago, it was assumed inflation was dead with the cover. With the dinosaur will go down as history as one of the greatest contrarian covers ever. This was the cover on Business Week, is inflation dead? Now we have magazine covers on the other side of things. Inflation is bad and the Fed failed is priced in. How inflation humbled America's central bank. Ben Graham with his hand over his face. Contrarian again, I say yes. Uh, course CPE is has been slowing down. This is from Cato Institute, and this is projected course PCE inflation, a key indicator from the Fed, uh, peaked in February. Uh, last month, last reading, it missed for March, and it's rolling over. We think this is going to continue on the basis of base effects. Uh, and um, as you can see, this is when inflation really ramped up in April, and then particularly May. So uh, that's where the base effects are going to kick in, and we're going to see this curve roll over. Uh, stock buybacks are helping fight inflation. Companies spending money to purchase their shares instead of expending on businesses will help bring demand back in line with supply. Okay, uh, that's one way to look at it. Uh, but the better way to think about that is uh, the buyback blackout period is over and 10 more reasons why Goldman calls the end of market car carnage. Um, so uh, what they lay out here, which is really interesting, is that the bulk of earnings happened uh, last week because you had all of the energy and uh, healthcare and tech stocks all report earnings. So what you're going to see is uh, earnings, uh, now that they've reported, they can get back in the market and start to buy stocks, and that's going to persist. And, and as we've covered before, the buyback authorization announcements are at record highs. So we're going to see more and more uh, buybacks coming through. And uh, that was the uh, intercom system. We'll ignore that. All right. Now, other uh, factors they point to, U.S. corporates return back to open window on Monday with dry powder. Uh, Rubner calculates $5 billion of demand per day until mid-June. Uh, pensions flip to buy given the recent outperformance of bonds versus stocks. Three, S&P gam index gamma turned negative on Thursday. Four, synthetic short gamma through CTA and vol controlled strategy supply will fade over the next week. Five, uh, I guess today is what they call fading. Liquidity is simply not available to cover liquid macro. Uh, top book liquidity in the S&P 500 is 2.8 million. This ranks as the first percentile in the last 10 years. Uh, six sentiment is the most bearish since the market crash lows of March 2009. That's pretty damn bearish, uh, which we've covered. Uh, money market inflows logged a massive 60 billion inflows last week. That means they're um, going to cash, nervous. Uh, fixed income, prime tax notes. Everyone's short. Ah, here, th this is what this is what slammed them yesterday and slammed them today. Everyone is short. Short leverage with options ranks in the 98th percentile in the last five years. And finally, new month, new inflows. Well, they didn't come in the first five days, so we'll see what happens. Here's the outflows. Here's the outflows, and you can trace it back when you get these aggressive outflows in a short period of time. You want to be a net buyer of quality things that are on sale. Uh, AAII we've covered ad infinitum and I think those are all the key charts that we need to uh, be concerned with uh, Tom Lee was out bullish of course uh, and um, he was talking about uh, five out of six times when you look out after the FOMC meeting stocks are up on top of that stocks remain attractive as an investment relative to bonds reinforcing the years long China trade or there's no alternative, we think stocks remain the best risk reward for the next five years. To add perspective to the relative opportunities between stocks and bonds, Lee highlighted that from 1990 to 2008, the S&P had an average price to earnings ratio of 18 times, similar to today's. Today's is 18.1 times forward, while the 10-year Treasury averaged 5.3%, which is significantly higher than today's Treasury yield, which closed at 3.1%. So um, there's a whole lot of room for yields to rise, but arguably the S&P... P.E. ratio is already at levels associated with a 5.3% 10-year yield. Uh, in other words, a lot of bad news is priced in. We agree with that, and we think that's a brilliant way of looking at things. We, we're panicking out over 3.01. Uh, you know, the market could sustain 18.1 times at 5.3 historically, provided the growth there, and the growth is still there with earnings up 
uh, 10% year on year, which is, implies as high as 51 to 5200 on the S&P before rolling over for a mild recession next year. Tevis sees a final opioid settlement coming this year. The whole basket of generics we've talked about in the past will absolutely rip after this happens. I think uh, building a basket of that over time is going to pay off big. Uh, now, here's the thing about Russia. Okay, no one's, no one's focused on this. So there, this is an article in the Wall Street Journal. As the coffins come home, Russians confront toll of Ukraine invasion. So now they're getting the real cost for nothing. Uh, and um, uh, public sentiment is probably going to start to turn against Putin on that basis because they were the aggressor. That's fine. So that's not going to stop Putin. What is? Uh, well, it's evident that Russia dodges default for now as investors get dollar, dollar funds. Everyone's been calling for Russia's default. It hasn't happened. They're doing everything under the sun to pay and get the dollars to not default, which tells me that this is a temporary, um, a temporary um, plan for them. They, 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 don't, they don't intend to be there in perpetuity because every bond payment, you're seeing them scramble the last minute to get the dollars to make the payment. If they knew they were going to take over Ukraine and be there forever and could care less about the rest of the world and foreign investment, why pay it? Why not just default and, and, uh, and stay and fight? The reason is it would blow them up and uh, they would never come back from it. So it tells me that the fuse is running thin on their exploits in uh, Ukraine. And when I talked about faith, uh, this is a man whose entire business is about faith, uh, and that's the Pope. This was in the New York Post, so take it for what it's worth. It's right up there with the with your uh, latest astrology reading. But uh, Pope Francis that says the Hungarian PM said the Russia invasion will end May 9th. And if the Pope has faith, maybe we should too. Uh, he said, quote, when I met Orban, he told me that Russians have a precise plan and that the war will end on May 9th. Uh, the Pope told an Italian newspaper, Corriere della Sera, in an interview published Tuesday. My Italian friends will, I'm sure, be texting me to uh, mock my accento, uh, but I try my best. So, I sure hope so. That would explain the speed of the military operations in the last few days, he continued, noting that Russia has been focused on taking the Black Sea ports away from the Ukraine, uh, ba -ba -ba. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I don't know if there's any significance to the Mar March 9th, but the uh, May 9th, but, but the way this market is setting up, it would not surprise me whatsoever. That, so that would be Friday. So that would be, that would mean it would end on Monday. And I would say, you know, probably not going to see a huge amount of buying into the weekend. Um, even if we get a little bounce, uh, but I could definitely see it, you know, turn around Tuesday uh, and be the final turnaround and, and start the march to new highs, uh, if that's the case. But uh, no one's covering it because, I mean, what what is there to stand on uh, other than faith? And sometimes faith is all you need, but um, we'll, we shall see. I've not heard this covered anywhere else other than this article by Callie Patterson uh, over at the New York Post. So, uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, Biden administration floating new lending rules for lower income areas. The game is on. For everyone that thinks housing is dead, it's just beginning. This happens every cycle. Everyone has a house, but the poor people, let's lend to the poor people. And it always, uh, you know, doesn't always turn out as expected. It, uh, it's uh, good intentions and the right ideas. But uh, we know that... Um, it's not always the best thing. So I'm all for helping people that, uh, you know, want to help themselves. And I think uh, the intentions are noble, but you have to be careful. All this is code for is loosen lending standards. You loosen lending standards. The game's going to be. So why did the housing uh, bubble continue to inflate after they were raising rates in 2004? Why did it go for another two or three years? Because over the next two years, they were loosening lending standards through through policies like this. So that's what they want to do now uh, into limited supply. And that's why I think home builders on any material weakness, like I said, I don't know if it was time yet, but I think it's starting to get really interesting again. Some of these home builders we're going to have an eye on.
Century 21 CEO warns that U.S. didn't build enough homes for this pent-up demand. Surging mortgage rates aren't cooling millennial Gen Z home buyer demand, Mike Meadler says. And why? Uh, because you got 72 million millennials that are on average age 72 and you don't, uh, 32 and you don't have nearly enough housing stock. And that's going to be the case for multiple years. So I think on real weakness, on rate fears, if we're topping out in rates as I think we're near, uh, I think they're going to be a monster secular play. Uh, this is from my friend Tiho. I love this right before we uh, delve into China. Uh, understanding the difference between real and perceived risk. Quote, Real risk and perceived risk are two different things. People perceive risk to be high when prices are low and perceive risk to be low when prices are high. That is the psychological problem that people have. That's Bill Miller, value investing legend, and it couldn't be uh, more accurate when it comes to China stocks and biotech stocks, and, and we'll see we'll see how that works out. So uh, China Z vows to promote healthy development of capital, signal softening stance toward private sector, pledges to give more space for capital to grow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. None of that's going to matter until they open the doors uh, to the city, but that's going to happen because cases are rolling over very aggressively in the last week. China plans reprieve for tech giants, including delaying new rules as economy slows. Okay, we know that. They're going to have a big meeting tomorrow, by the way. We'll see whether Xi heads it up. Um, and then Charlie Munger at the annual meeting. This was not covered at all, which was surprising to me, but um, you can see him here. Uh, I don't think the speakers are working, but basically people ask, why do you buy Chinese companies? He goes, I, buy, I bought Chinese companies and I buy Chinese companies because I can get so much better companies at such lower prices. Uh, so he seemed to have aggressive conviction in his Alibaba and in his China view. Uh, so, by the way, you can just get that on your own. Go to CNBC Television at YouTube and just uh, put in the search bar. I can get much better companies at so much lower prices. So you can listen to him say that, <laughs> what I just told you. Uh, BYD sees first quarter sales jump 180% while COVID hits another uh, other Chinese automakers. This shows the intrinsic demand. And by the way, one of the themes that we're working on and we have... Uh, building quite a large position in one of the auto supply manufacturers um, that we're very excited about. We think it's going to be very similar to the Teneco trade that um, uh, Munger did in uh, in the early 2000s where he turned 10 million into 80 million and then he gave uh, the 80 million to uh, Lilu and turned it into 500 million in, over the next decade. So um, we think there are a lot of these things setting up. You're, you don't have a catalyst for change. So here's the problem. No semiconductors, no new cars. No new cars, auto park companies don't have anyone to sell to. They're beaten down to hell. So your whole analysis is, can this business stay solvent for two years until the semis come back, the cars come back? Because the demand is pent up like nobody's business. And that's why I brought up this BYD article, because obviously they figured out how to get their own parts and that's why they had the first quarter sales jump of 180%, even with the COVID shutdowns, um, uh, because they were able to get the parts to meet the demand. The demand for cars, for new cars, is through the roof in the United States. It's backlogged now for two plus years because of the semiconductors. And uh, once those semiconductors come, you're going to see new cars selling like crazy, even if you get a mild recession. And these parts makers that people are wondering if they're going to live another day, all you got to do is balance sheet analysis. Don't worry about upside. Just worry about protecting the downside. If you can get comfortable that they've got enough liquidity for two to three years to, to make it through until the chips come, which I think are going to come much faster than expected, um, and, uh, and get the new car demand, pent-up demand uh, met, they're going to just mint money, just like what happened with Teneco during the 9-11 recession from 2000 to 2003. Uh, it was just getting through that. And they, they were a much bigger solvency risk than some of the companies, that, that, by the way, that Munger took. Everyone says, wow, that was a no-brainer. No, it wasn't a no-brainer. His bonds were trading at 30 cents on the dollar. They were close to bankruptcy. So he had some big cojones to go in on that, and uh, he gambled and won. Some of these companies are so well capitalized because they all tapped the market during COVID when money was free and backstopped by the government 
uh, for people to issue unlimited amounts of debt. So they've got the liquidity. So you don't even have to take the credit risk. All you have to do is be able to know that this is the case. Real risk and perceived risk are two different things. People perceive risk to be high when prices are low and perceive risk to be low when prices are high. And they found out at the beginning of this year, we, we were calling for a 10% correction in the first quarter. We got 10% plus, 13 and a change in the S&P. But no one was talking about that last year. It was just up and up and up. And we said, you know, this is going to change. The environment is going to change next year. And it certainly has. And... Um, uh, and now we think it's now we think it's time to buy. A lot of the prices on these things are down. Now, am I a buyer of ETFs of the S and P 500? No, I'm not. I'm a buyer of high quality businesses or medium quality that have strong balance sheet that are just so beaten down. It's like you know picking up dollars on the street. It's it's like it's raining dollars. All you got to do is bend down and pick them up. And when it rains gold, go out with a bucket, not a thimble. And that's what we're trying to do with some of these opportunities, whether it's China, whether it's biotech, or whether it's this one uh, automaker in particular. So China cracked down on big tech companies. Now it needs them. Surprise, surprise. Alibaba, JD, uh, Meituan have the distribution networks to supply the cities during COVID lockdowns. They have a lot more in terms of uh, he's going to need them to employ people because they've all laid off 20% because of the brilliant crackdown, which now he's backpedaled on. So basically, he screwed 20% of the, the the smartest, highest paid population of his country. Now he's like, eh, that was a mistake. So he destroyed 20% of their lives. And now uh, he's got to help these businesses grow again so they can rehire those people so he can stay in power without riots. Because there are there is a lot of discontent starting to happen, starting with Shanghai residents protest lockdown with marches, smashed vegetables and art projects. So, you know, it starts with smashed vegetables. It starts with it, it ends with smashed glass windows and uh, everything else that uh, that a fragile government does not want to see. Uh, so they've got to do an about face and they're doing it. They're just not doing it quickly enough, but they may get saved just by virtue of the fact the cases are, in fact, rolling over. New China policies to support big tech platforms in innovation globalization. Official newspaper says this is from South China Morning Post. This is from today. News of the policy aligns with political messaging in Beijing that the months long crackdowns are on the tech sector would start to ease. Crackdowns that started at the end of 2020 have wiped out about $2 trillion in value from China tech stocks, compounding pandemic-fueled economic woes. So they're going to reverse that. Surprise, surprise. Took them a little longer than the last time a few years ago. But sure enough, they always blink. Uh, Biden officials divided over easing China tariffs to slow inflation. The U.S. government's now going to blink. They're going to unwind the Chinese tariffs because of inflation. That's going to be another boon to China. Uh, and Chinese, Chinese equities, and they have no choice in the matter because uh, the natives are getting restless over here as well. No one likes high prices. Uh, threading the needle stock market, and no one's going to wait for the lagged effect of commodities rolling over either. No matter how many times they listen to my podcast, they go to the gas station and they're, it's $5 a gallon in California for regular. And they say, I, yeah, I don't care what the commercials are doing. My, you know, my, uh, uh, you know, this is too expensive to fill up my F-150 or whatever. So, uh, thread the needle stock market and sentiments. This is the article of the week, <clears throat> Wednesday afternoon. By the way, all of this is opinion, not advice. Go to hedgefundtips.com, click on terms. It's all there. Do your own homework. I don't know your situation. I deal exclusively with accredited investors and qualified institutions. So um, so I've underlined the key points from the meeting. Um, you can read through that because we're running short on time here. But what I would say is the key was from the press the press conference. The most important thing that happened during the press conference is he said, quote, a 75 basis points hike is not something the committee is actively considering, which means that the fear uh, people thought that he was going to be raising 75 is, is no longer on the table. It, he did say 50 basis point hikes are on the table for the next couple of meetings. So my guess is he goes, you know, 50, 50, maybe 50 again. I think the terminal, I think he raised up to 250. Uh, in um, in the last tightening cycle from 2016 to 2018. So anyway, uh, that was key. He said he expects a soft or soft-ish landing. That's an interesting uh, descriptive. 
Uh, households and businesses are still in good shape in terms of savings, in terms of business investment was nearing double digits. Last read, uh, excess savings expects uh, the labor market stronger than ever. You saw the jolts, I think 11.4 million job openings this week, more jobs available than people not employed. I think 6.7 not employed, 11.4 open. That's not the sign of a recession. Sure, that will change in coming months, but it's still too strong right now. Um, and then we got this, you know, bounce 5.4 off the rally. I think we gave back three and a half today on the S&P. So we're still above these lows. It's kind of a retest kiss just to scare the hell out of everyone who got squeezed yesterday, then chased up and got their faces ripped off today. I like that movement because what's going to happen is as we start to push higher and no one's positioned for it, uh, all of those people that would have wanted to put their shorts on aren't aren't going to have any dry powder because they got double effed yesterday and today being on the wrong side both days. That's where all the margin calls came from. So the next time this push is higher, they're not going to be so keen to uh, throw on their shorts or chase. And that's when you just get this wall of worry climb where, where I think we can push to new highs before we have to start to worry about the recession next year. Um, Okay, and then uh, I want to thank Ellie Terrett and Liz Clayman and Cheryl Cassoni for having me on late last week. We covered this one I, in last week's podcast video cast because I think I went on right before the uh, before the call. But we'll just pick out a few points. Uh, one, we uh, unpacked the negative GDP print and we pointed to why uh, we didn't expect two consecutive quarters at this point based on inventories, based on defense spending. Uh, and um, and this and the trade deficit because of the timing of shipments. But um, and we talked about value tech that was generating money. We still agree with that view. Here are estimates for next year. Finally, top the 230, 230.09. Next year, 251.57. These have to come down a lot before you really have to worry about things. That they're they're still going up. Uh, that's a positive thing. Earnings are the name of the game. Uh, as Larry Kudlow used to say when he had a show, he would uh, he does have a show on Fox Business, but I uh, haven't heard him say it very often, which is uh, earnings are the mother's milk of the stock market or something to that effect. And there's no question that that's true. Um, economic surprise index highest in over a year, meaning data coming in better than expected. Now, I want to. Uh, and then the sentiment indicators when sentiment got this low in the AAI bulls minus bears. On average, six months later, the S&P is up 12.5%, 12 months later, up 20%. Now, common misconception. We have laid out the case for our two largest positions, Alibaba and biotech, in recent podcasts. Now, the key components of the bear thesis are, number one, tech and biotech will not work in a tightening cycle slash rising rate environment. And number two, emerging markets, i.e. China, can't work when rates are rising and the dollar is strong. Um, I always aim to burden myself with the facts because those are kind of like colloquialisms that uh, actually don't bear out when you measure it. Uh, and uh, in these cases, the facts simply don't support the, the exodus. The last tightening cycle from 2016 to 2018 was one of the best performing periods for both biotech and Alibaba, uh, which oddly have a high correlation uh, if you look at these charts. Now, the underperformance of both assets came leading up to the beginning of the tightening. This is a classic case of sell the rumor, buy the news. So here is the chart of the XBI biotech ETF. Okay, here is the Fed funds rate. So you got your first hike. Okay, all of this weakness came during this period where they were starting to talk about hiking rates. So they did their first hike. You got your 50% collapse in the XBI. And then as they continue to hike and tighten and roll off the balance sheet, what happened to XBI over the next 24 months? It was up over 140% into a rising, aggressively rising 2.5% terminal rate uh, market. It appreciated 140%. What has happened this time? Again, over 50% correction into the first hike okay so you had that hike you got your final collapse now we're in the second hike and guess what it starts to go up the same story here 
and I think we're going to have a similar result in coming years. Oh, but the dollar can't be strong. You can't have a strong dollar and have these companies do well. Well, the dollar had gone parabolic into 2016 and remained strong through most of the tightening cycle, but it did stop going up. And that's what we're looking for. And that's what we think is going to happen is that the dollar is going to stop going up. It may grind sideways, but the rate of change, same thing with the 10 year rate. Uh, and by the way, how do we know that most is priced in? That's one of the ask me anything questions that I'm going to answer right now. Um, well, all right. I don't know who asked it, but I'll, I'll, I'll give them acknowledgement at the end of the call. Uh, because if you look at the two-year yield, it's at 270. The last hiking cycle, which most of these have had lower terminal rates over the last 40 years, and the same is going to be true now because debt has gone up, not down. Uh, my guess is the terminal rate is going to be 2%, if that, okay? Uh, so the, two, the two-year yield is whatever it was today, 270 and change, probably 275, maybe 280. Uh, if it was a 20, I th think someone said it was a 20 basis point spread, but let's call it 275. That's way more than where we're going to be at the terminal rate. And that's why I'm saying more rates are priced in than are actually going to happen. I think our terminal rate is going to be two on the Fed funds futures and, um, and, uh, and that's going to be the, the name of the game. So uh, there you go. Now, here's what happened when they started to roll off, stop reinvesting in the uh, balance sheet. Again, this was a taper and this was a roll off of the balance sheet during the same exact period. And just beforehand, same thing. The balance sheet had gone parabolic and then it levels off. Dollar's going to level off. Um, rates going up is going to le level off on the 10-year yield. This will keep going up, but it's already priced in at 270, which is probably not going to get to two, you know, two and then on the two-year, maybe 220 terminal rate. So, um we just love this setup. I, I mean, it's kind of nuts that I would be happy on a day like today, but I, I just like it more. So, because um, I'm burdened by the facts. That's the name of the game. Not the emotions, not the dislocation, not the forced selling, but but just the facts. And um, during the last Fed hike balance, okay, during the last Fed hike balance sheet roll-off period from 2016 to 2019, not only did biotech appreciate 140%, which we just covered here, but Alibaba appreciated 263% trough to peak over the same tightening cycle. So what was happening? The dollar went parabolic and then it stopped going up. It didn't really go down, but it stopped going up. Uh, you got the first rate, rate hike under your belt and that's where it bottomed. It, it dropped from 120 down to 57.20 on fears of the hikes. And then after the hike started getting going, it moved from trough to peak 263%. And what's happening now? The dollar is going to stop going up in our view. Uh, and you've got your first hikes under your belt. Uh, the remainder of the hikes are priced in already at the two-year yield. And all of the conditions are set. Then you got the stimulus. Then you'll get the COVID cases roll off. And we think Baba is going to be a monster. It's going to absolutely be a monster in our view. Now, the two black lines on the bottom of the chart, so the Fed funds rate in the U.S. dollar, we can see by the blue vertical lines exactly where we are in the tightening process and what happened next. You ha you had done your first rate hike. You had done your first rate hike. Boom. You, you crashed into that situation, crashed into that situation, and then reversed for the biggest rallies in history into tightening, into strong dollar, into all that stuff that no one says. Everyone says emerging markets can't go up until the dollar goes down. That's not the case. It just stops going up. Rates can continue to rise. Why? Because it's already priced in. That's why you had the crash already. And the two-year at 2 270 is because it's already priced in. The pain is now rear view. You got to look through the windshield if you want to make money and you got to bet on the pocket aces. So, I also want to point out another key factor that China bears are pointing to at present. The weakening of the yuan over the last week cannot be ignored since Chinese authorities first allowed it to begin moving in 2005. It has only once dropped as much over five days, and that was August 2015. Devaluation that sparked months of near crisis conditions in world markets. Okay, that sounds ominous. 
I be I better be on guard for months of near crisis conditions in world markets, except for the fact that's rearview mirror. Now, this Bloomberg note points to that the fact that the last time the yuan weakened this much in five days. Uh, okay, spark months of near crisis conditions. What it does not highlight in this piece is that the yuan devaluation sparked one of the biggest multi-year rallies in the history of China tech with Alibaba rallying 270% from August 2015 when the last devaluation like this happened uh, to July 2018. If that is, quote, near crisis conditions, sign me up. I'll supersize it. I'll do a double order. I want more of that. So um, this is exactly where the quote, months of near crisis conditions started. August 2015, that's when they devalued the yuan. And what happened to Alibaba for the next two and a half years? 270% off of the lows uh, in two and a half years. So the Chinese government knows what's what. They know why they want a weak currency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is going to be one more key factor in turning this ship around and ripping your face off. It's amazing how much when you look at the scheme of things and you just zoom out a little bit, all the noise that we've had to talk about and all the flat out bullshit we've had to deal with for the last three months for these two little silly red bars, which mean absolutely nothing in the scheme of things. I mean, it's basically like talking nonstop about Alibaba during this period when it absolutely meant nothing in the greater scheme of things as it rallied 263% after the first, first couple of hikes. Um, and that's just, you know, that's just the name of the game. I choose to do this on a weekly basis. Uh, so I got to talk about it on a weekly basis. But in the scheme of things, this whole mashugana here is going to be pointless, absolute noise. That means nothing as this thing starts to reverse and just rip higher. And I think that in the scheme of things, like last time it made meaningful new highs, I think this time it's going to make meaningful new highs uh, several years out because we're buying quality. Now, um, here's a clip from last week's video cast regarding China Tech. In this, I just basically talk about, you know, the Great Depression buying in 1932 like Joe Kennedy, you know, 1974 when Buffett was buying hand over fist, uh, the tech wreck when you could have bought Amazon at 90% discount uh, to its uh, uh, 2000 highs, just like the K-Web right now, 80% down from its highs. It's like a Great Depression for China Tech. Looking a few years out, did you want to be a buyer or seller in the middle of the depression, in the middle of the tech wreck, in the middle of 1974? If you had bought during those periods, your wealth would be beyond any of your wildest imaginations or dreams. And I think that's the setup right now uh, for that. So the good news is that stimulus has been pouring into the Chinese economy since November. While the rest of the world is tightening, China is the only one large economy aggressively stimulating with fiscal policy and loosening monetary policy at the same time. The bad news is it will not be felt in the economy until the lockdowns end. There is a light at the end of the tunnel as cases are now rolling over just like they did during the first wave over two years ago. Here's what that looked like. It spiked, rolled over. Here's what that looked like. Spike, we're rolling over. This is done. This is, I'm, I, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor. I don't even play one on TV, but... The data looks to me like very damn similar. It's it's not enough case studies, but it looks like it's going a lot better than most people would have you believe. So uh, let's uh, have quote unquote faith like the Pope that Russia will end on the ninth uh, from his lips to God's ears. Uh, but um, who knows? Who knows? I, I think they're getting tired, and I think they're they're getting worried about making those bond payments because once they miss, they're 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 done. So um, all right. Bullish sentiment ticked up a little bit this week, still at bearish levels. A lot of fear in the market, fear and greed. That probably went down to 30 today. A lot of fear and managers are over, under, dramatically underweight. So any strength they'll have to bid. Earnings, Dow top 30 estimates up 24 basis points in the last 30 days. The index is down 13%. That's an interesting divergence I like. Uh, NASDAQ earnings, top 30 weights down 4% in the last 60 days, but the index is down 24%. So that's an interesting divergence that we're interested in. Um, earnings, we went through. And then 
Uh, economic data, construction spending was a little bit light. ISM manufacturing was still in expansion, but missed expectations. ISM manufacturing PMI, still in expansion, 55.4. Missed expectations of 57.6, but meaningfully in expansion. Uh, manufacturing prices were lower than expected. Again, that points to all those commodity charts I was going through, input costs. Factory orders were better than expected. Job openings, 11.5, not 11.4. They only expected 11, uh, up from 11.3. So more jobs than, you don't get recessions when there are unlimited amounts of jobs. You get recessions when your neighbor is getting laid off. Um, all right, uh, market composite services, PMI better than expected. That's good to see. Non-manufacturing PMI was came in slightly less, but strongly in expansion. Crude inventory is a slight build versus a draw expected. Um, Continuing claims, this is the most important number, came down again, 1.38 versus 1.4 million estimated. That's strong, uh, and that's most of that. So let's do a couple Ask Me Anything questions and wrap it up. Thomas, I noticed your bullishness. Uh, this is from Marcel. Bullishness on Chinese listed stocks and KWeb. I run a YouTube channel with 45,000 subscribers about investing in Chinese stocks. Okay, this guy wants to interview me, so I'll probably do that for him. George R., um, Tom, thank you for this great service you provide. I've personally benefited financially and in regard to my approach to the market. Apologies if you answer this. How does one determine whether the market has already priced in X or number of the Fed rate hikes? I, oh, per, great, super duper question. And that's why I spent so much time covering it, George. It's already priced in the two year. Just look at the two year yield is at 270. Uh, we're probably, the terminal rate last cycle was below 250. It's probably going to be, you know, 2.00 which implies, what are we at, 75 bips, so uh, 125, 175, probably three more 50, max three more 50 basis point hikes and we're done. Uh, that's my guess. Probably 50, 50, 25, 25, and we're done. Uh, ben, first name only, how overbought is XLE? Same question as always, I just, I don't wanna be a buyer here. I went through the commodities. Uh, if you wanna bet that the war is gonna continue for another four months, then go long at $107, have at it. But uh, the trap door will open. The question is whether you're on the elevator. Um, ben, first name owner, uh, thoughts on biotech? Just read the article, it's all right there. I think it's a home run. Catalyst that could send it higher, it's gonna be two things, drug approvals and M&A. We haven't seen any material ones yet, but they're all in the pipeline. You often see a lot in the, in the June period with the PDUFA. Uh, but my guess is you're going to start to see a lot more M&A coming very shortly because the companies with the patent cliffs have all the cash and they're going to, they're, they know growth is slowing and they're going to have to, to buy, buy, buy. Uh, Javier R, uh, been a fan and follower of your podcast for a year, have 450 million under management, like to discuss allocation of your hedge fund. Fantastic. We're going to be in touch. Uh, Zacharia K. Hi, Tom. Thank you for another great video. Do you think Chinese ADRs will be affected by the shallow recession you predict next year, or do you think they will be unscathed? I think with all the easing and liquidity, uh, they've got 70% consumption. I think the, the stock that we're in is going to do quite well, even if the U.S. slows a bit. And again, this is going to be a shallow recession. I don't think it's going to be a material recession because, you know, even if unemployment goes from 3.6 to 4%, it's not 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 the end of the world. Uh, Marat A, thank you for your weekly market insights. I have a couple questions. What do you think about Citibank at these current levels with interest rates rising, making their income from loans higher? Shouldn't the bank benefit from that? They benefit from the spread, so no, but they have a diversified business. Um, what way do you value financial stocks? I would value Citi right now on a discount to a tangible book, which is a meaningful discount, a historically uh, big discount. Uh, and it's cheap. So if I had to buy a bank right now, I'd probably start to nibble at City. Uh, I think that's okay. Um, when you buy long dated options, do you buy them in the money or out of the money? On those, I bought out of the money call spreads uh, because the when things crash, the implied volatility goes up. So if you only have one leg of the option, you're generally paying too much money <clears throat> with Sometimes it pays to pay too much money because it's just become too dislocated and it snaps right back like we saw with Alibaba. But in the case of uh, Boeing, I did long dated out of the money call options spread. Uh, and I think the EV is either five or 10 X on those. I don't know how, I can't remember how wide the spread is and how much I paid on it. But um, 
I just I just don't even have it open in front of me. Um, but that's how I did those to offset the high implied volatility. So I'm paying too much on the long leg. I'm collecting uh, by selling it for too much money on the short end. And then I've got the, still got the spread and I wasn't impacted as much by implied volatility as I would just going long one leg. Uh, what do you think about Disney at these current levels? I, I like it. I definitely like it here. The parks are going to be busting at the seams. They've got all these movies coming out. It's going to be absolutely fine. Uh, leaving the political noise aside and everything else, which in their worst case downside is tens of millions, which is kind of de minimis relative to the size of the business. And more likely than not, um, nothing's going to happen to them on, uh, on the basis of uh, political stuff. Irrespective of whether I agree, disagree, don't agree, I have no view on that political side. I only care what happens to the business because we're talking about the stock and I think the stock's a buy. So with that said, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We covered a ton in a short amount of time. Um, and uh, we'll be back next week, same time, same place. Thanks for tuning in. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.